Blessed be guys and ghouls. Today I want to share something with you that has me so stoked. Candles. You heard me right. Those things you light to make your room smell nice or to put a certain someone in the mood. I want to show you how to make these puppies. Why make candles? They're so cheap. They probably seem like a messy waste of time, right? Oh no, 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 my dark little souls. You see, last year I got hand fasted to the man of my dreams. At our wedding reception, we had a lot of candles. And with all of those candles, we ended up with massive amounts of unscented, white, melted candle wax just sitting there, daring us to do something with them. You know what I mean. No, not that, you perverts. I'm no candle expert, but I've had pretty good results with this technique, so I figured I'll just pass it on to you guys. Because seriously, making your own candles, kind of awesome. Now real quick, you can buy candle making kits online, but where's the fun in that? We are upcycling sorcerers here. We can make magic out of thin air or yogurt glasses, as the case may be. You get the point. When you make your own candles, not only are you rescuing flammable candle wax from the landfill, but you can also make them any scent, color, level of awesomeness you like. You can give them as gifts, use them to lighten the mood in your home, see what I did there, or imbue them with intent to use with any prayer or ritual. You are the only limit. Disclaimer here, we'll be dealing with hot wax, duh. Take proper precautions because you can burn yourself really badly if you're not careful. Don't be an idiot. Also, when we're done with our little DIY du jour, you will be left with an actual real life candle. Again, don't be an idiot. Never leave a lit candle unattended. Don't burn yourself. Don't set your house on fire. If things go sideways, it's on you. Speaking of things going sideways, this is a DIY video. So if any injuries occur, I'm going to try my best to keep from exposing you to them. I have a lot of friends with blood and injury triggers, so out of respect for them, I'm going to try to respect other people with those same issues. However, I am not responsible for the bad decisions of other people. Let me break that down for you. I will respect triggers to a point, however, I will not bend my will to every single person who just might be offended by something I do or say. If I did that, I would have no content to offer you. I know someone who is legitimately triggered. I know someone who is legitimately triggered by repeated exposure to Pokemon. Now after he explained it to me, it made sense, but I cannot be held responsible for the actions of people who did horrible things to him within that context. Now enough of that. On that cheery note, let's tally ho. Hey all, welcome to my kitchen. So yes, this is a real actual kitchen, so if things are a little messy, bear with me, we just made dinner up in this piece. Anyhow, I wanted to show you guys around and break things down to you so we can start making some candle magic. I wanted to take the time to show you guys some of the tools I have in my arsenal when it comes to candle making. These first pieces of equipment are things that we won't be using in this video, but I wanted to show them to you anyway in case you wanted to continue making candles in the future. I really wanted to show off these first items to you, which are candle molds. Candle molds can come in many shapes and sizes. They can look like this, or this, or this, or this. You can use them to make just about any kind of candle you can think of. For example, this guy is used to make taper candles. This guy will make small pillar candles. Round candles, which are pretty awesome. And of course, votive candles which I'm sure you've seen before. They look something like this. These are some candles I made for Yule last year. I picked these up on Etsy, but you can find them just about anywhere that sells craft goods. They're really easy to use. 
you just spread a thin layer of Vaseline along the inside, thread through your wick, and cover the hole with wax adhesive and pour in your wax. After your candle is fully set, you just pop it out. So onward to what we will actually be using in this video. Firstly, we will be using these guys. These are glass yogurt containers that have had the labels removed and have been thoroughly cleaned. Before that, they looked something like this. This is the Weed brand from YoPlay. These containers are really nice, not only because they're a nice size, but most importantly, the containers are glass. Very, very important. Do not, do not, do not, do not ever, ever, ever use plastic containers when making candles. You risk melting the plastic, destroying your property, and seriously injuring yourself. So don't do it. It's got to be glass. I'm upcycling these yogurt containers, as you can see. I've got quite a few stashed up, and these are what our candles will eventually live in. You can do this with baby food jars, mason jars, or any other glass container you have around. Removing the labels off of these guys are super easy. Once you are able to peel up a corner of the label, it's relatively easy to peel the entire label off. You will notice that there is some sticky residue here. That is where this bad boy comes in. Goo Gone is one of my go-tos when it comes to removing labels or sticky residue of any kind. It works on glue, latex paint, and a lot of other gooey adhering substances. Goof Off is another alternative, but Goo Gone is my boy. It's really great stuff. So what I do is I'll spray Goo Gone all over the outside of the jar, focusing on where there is adhesive. Let it sit for five minutes, then scrub it off with soap and water. Works like a charm. Earlier, I had mentioned that after our hand fasting, we ended up with a big mess of melted wax from all of the candles at our reception. What I did was broke up that wax and I melted it down and poured it into nice manageable chunks. Naturally, I couldn't resist the opportunity to goff up the process ever so slightly. What I did was I poured my wax into silicone ice cube mold to make little skull wax chunks and little bat wax chunks. This is totally optional. Some people will pour their wax into a loaf and then cut it into cubes, and that works too. You're just going to want some manageable chunks. This will really help you to gauge how much wax you're using, and that way you won't be wasting wax. Speaking of melting down wax, this is my wax boiler. This was a bit of a splurge for me. I say splurge lightly, it was only about 10 bucks. But this thing has been really useful for melting down candle wax. If you plan on doing this a lot, I highly recommend picking one up. You can get by just fine without it, in fact, one thing I did for a long time was use aluminum cans to melt my wax. I would take a clean aluminum can and cut along the upper edge very carefully to make a miniature melting pot. I would put that in a small pot of water to make a double boiler and melt my wax inside the can. It will work just fine, but because it is a smaller container, you won't be able to melt a lot of wax at once and it can be prone to tipping, so just be careful. Now you can't have candles without wicks. First, I have this small gauge wick that I purchased from a small business on Etsy. This is an all natural hemp wick coated in beeswax. Because this wick is smaller, it will work well with smaller candles like votives or tapers. It's important to use the appropriate wick size for your candle size, otherwise you risk your candle burning down too quickly or burning unevenly. And that would really be a bummer. I'll leave a link to where I got this wick down below. You can probably find similar wicks out there for cheaper, but this way is supporting a small business with responsible practices. Now on the flip side, I picked these up at Michael's. These are useful because they come with a metal tab attached and they are all cut to a uniform length. These are a nice thick gauge and are a little on the long side, perfect for mason jar candles. I also picked this up at Michael's. This is the wick we will be using today. 
This wick is a little different because this cord is not waxed, which means that it's prone to fraying and it won't hold its shape when posed. This can make things a little trickier when you are setting your candles, but on the other hand, I have a lot of it and it was cheap. You can also purchase wooden wicks, which I haven't made candles with before, but I would love to try one day. From my experience using candles with wooden wicks, they are very large, but tend to burn very slowly. So if you have a large scented candle, it would definitely make a lot of sense. See what I did there? I also have a lot of random doodahs and gadgets that I use to hold the wicks as the wax is setting. I'll make sure you get nice and familiar with these later on. I just wanted to explain their presence to you. Another thing that's really, really important is to have a wax adhesive. This is super, super critical. When you pour your liquid wax into its receptacle, if you don't have a way to secure your wick to the bottom, your wick will float up to the top. This bag is full of candle colorants. There are many ways to color your candles naturally, or you are more than welcome to stick with plain white candles, but for the purpose of this video, I'm gonna use what I have on hand, which are these wax dyes I picked up at Michael's. You can also use solid wax dyes to color your candles, or if you wanna turn your upcycling up to 11, you can use broken crayons to color your candles as well. Just keep in mind that a little bit goes a long way. I have liquid dyes in yellow, blue, and red because with these primary colors, you can create just about any hue you would like. Another ingredient we will be using is candle scents. When I first started making candles, I used artificial candle making scents, which I still have a few of. I picked these up at Michael's but as I continue making candles, I've been switching over to using essential oils to scent my candles instead. These are not only more natural, but they are also aromatherapeutic and more meaningful, both qualities that are important when making ritual candles. I've been trying to use up the artificial scents that I have, which right here are, quote, Christmas tree, vanilla, and sandalwood. I use this scent a lot when I make wintertime candles. I grew up in the mountains and the scent of pine and fir are so deeply imbued in my Yuletime memories. Having a tree scented candle is a must. However, many of us have essential oils on hand already, so I highly recommend using them. Right here, I have lavender and tea tree, which are two biggies. These two oils will take you far and I really think everyone should have some in their cupboard. I use them in candle making, homemade beauty products, and so much more. However, you can use any essential oil you have on hand. These particular oils have the bonus of pouring out in drops, so you don't have to worry about futzing with an eyedropper. For example, this one I ruined early on because I accidentally stuck it in the wax, which is why it's opaque. Speaking of natural scents, a really awesome way to amp up your candles is by using real herbs and incense. I bought these lavender blossoms on Etsy, but you can find lavender just about anywhere. When I made lavender vanilla scented candles, I let the wax cool and then I topped the candles with more wax and sprinkled the blossoms on top. The results were very similar to this guy. As the candle burns down, the flame will also affect the blossoms releasing their scent into the air like incense. Speaking of incense, I've also got these. I bought this resin incense from my local metaphysical store. They call it the quote Christmas blend and it has frankincense, myrrh, and a bunch of other goodies. I use it with my Yule tree candles. Now with this guy, I flubbed up and put it in the liquid wax without letting the base of the candle harden which is why these have a sunken in look, but they will burn just fine. And because this is actual incense, when the flame hits that resin, it smells so nice. People love this one, and a lot of them say it's their favorite candle. All right, so I've broken down my stash for you guys, so what do you say? Let's get candle making. So I've brought you guys over to the stove because we are about to heat things up. Again, I want to urge you all not to be idiots. Use your brains, and we will have a lot of fun. 
first things first, I'm gonna take this big old pot and fill it up with an inch or two of water. Okay, now I've got my pot over here on the stove. I haven't turned it on yet, but I wanted to show you guys that you really don't need a lot of water. We just wanna create a double boiler situation. You don't wanna to use too little because OBS wax is highly flammable, and if it gets too hot, it can combust. But you also don't wanna to use too much water or your melting pot will tip and be uncontrollable when the water starts to bubble. As you can see, even with the small amount of water I'm using, my pot is trying to make a run for it. Luckily, when I add wax, it will sink down and be more manageable. Okay, time to turn on the stove. Theoretically. Victory! Now it's time to add wax to my melting pot. It looks like I have a lot of candles to make, so I'm gonna dump my whole bag into the pot and hope for the best. FYI, if you don't have a stash of recycled wax lying around, you can purchase wax in blocks, shavings, and pellets from any crafting supplier. I urge you to experiment and find out what kind of wax is best for you and your needs. Now, as you can see, the pot is still floating a little bit, but it's not completely out of control, and as the water heats up, it will evaporate, so it's good to have a little buffer. Okay, so it's been a few minutes, and as you can see, our wax has completely liquefied. This is the fun part, because now we get to add some color and some scents. Right now, I'm aiming to make a very herbal, energizing scent, so I'm gonna combine sandalwood, rosemary, and some tea tree oil. Tea tree oil is awesome for all kinds of uses. In fact, we keep it in our medicine cabinet, but by itself, it's a somewhat, ahem, acquired scent. So I like to pair it with other herbs. It's usually lavender, but this time I'm going for some other herbal scents. Rosemary is super energizing. I've seen people put it in the roots of their hair to stimulate hair growth and sandalwood because sandalwood is one of my all-time favorite scents. I especially love it when it's paired with patchouli or nag champa. It makes me think of my aunt's house. This artificial one actually isn't the best, but frankly, I want to use it up. So there. First, I'm going to add the tea tree. Now, since there is a good amount of wax here, I'm going to use 30 drops. Now I'm going to add 30 drops of rosemary. Finally, I'm going to add the sandalwood. Now, because this guy doesn't have a handy drop top, I'm using an eyedropper. This eyedropper has measurements along the side, which makes portioning your scents a lot easier. I like to start with adding only a half a milliliter at a time, and I'm doing that twice, so we're adding a total of one milliliter. Like anything else in the kitchen, you want to be conservative because you can always add more, but you can't take it away. I have these old janky chopsticks that I use exclusively for candle making. It smells really nice, but I'm gonna add a little more sandalwood because I think it needs more muskiness to bring down the scent profile. The scent right now is very sharp, which is nice. That's what makes it energizing, but I don't want that to be the only thing you can smell. I just added two milliliters of sandalwood. It smells really, really nice, so I'm going to double the scent ingredients so that when the candles burn, their scent will disperse around the room instead of just in the immediate vicinity of the candle. Think of those terrible Glade candles. Totally toxic, but don't get me wrong, I'm completely addicted to them. Anyhow, if they do anything well, they're really great about dispersing their scent around an entire room. I don't know what kind of magic Glade, Febreze, and Bath and & Body are weaving, but I have as of yet to reach that same level of candle smelliness. But hey, we're gonna keep trying. <coughs> you know how in chemistry class they teach you not to sniff directly from the container? Yeah, this is why. So this is starting to smell like bug spray. I'm gonna switch things up slightly. I'm gonna add a little bit of vanilla to try to foof it up and a little bit of lavender because lavender is really great at neutralizing tea tree. Plus, lavender is awesome. I'm not adding a lot because I don't want this to be a lavender candle. I just wanna mellow things out. 
Oh yeah, that smells really, really lovely. Now before we move on to adding color, I just wanna take this moment to mention that as you are adding scents and colors to your candle, these are all opportunities to imbue your candles with intent and meaning if you choose to create these for ritual work. Traditionally, people will rub unscented candles with ritual oils and carve sigils or runes into candles for ritual work. However, if you really wanna create something really potent and meaningful, I recommend creating your ritual candles from scratch and seeing each step in the process as an opportunity to add magical elements. You can reuse candles from previous rituals in order to distill the power you already imbued into it. You can use a wick made from a significant material or consecrated with a significant material, such as being blessed with holy water. Just make sure it dries before using it or make your own wick using natural or colored fibers. But I digress from the candle making. Because these candles have a very energetic and uplifting scent, I wanna use an energetic and uplifting color. I'm thinking yellow. I've never made yellow candles before, so this is gonna be a first time for the rest of us. I'm taking the eyedropper and adding quite a lot to make a vibrant color. Now, don't be misled by the color in the pot because remember the wax was white when it was solid, so despite the fact that the wax in the pot is quite dark, as it solidifies, it's gonna lighten up significantly. I'm also going to add some red to the pot to try to warm up the candle's color quite a bit. This is gonna make it a bit more of a butternut color. All right, this next part of the process is the most challenging. This is when we start to assemble our candles. First, we're gonna attach the wicks to the bottom of our containers. I've got an old cutting board here, so I'm going to go ahead and line up the containers on top of it. I'm using an old cutting board because not only will it make cleanup easier, but if I need to move the candles out of the way after I pour them, that will be way easier as well. Obviously, I don't have enough wax to fill up all of the glasses, but I'm gonna go ahead and set them up because I can set whatever I have left aside for another time. So next I'm gonna take my scissors to cut the wicks and use my wax adhesive to stick the wicks to the bottom of the jars. You're gonna take your wicks, measure the depth of your container, and double the wick length. I'll show you why later. This doubled length is how much wick you will need for each candle. Once I have this measured out, I'm gonna go ahead and double that a bunch of times until I have enough wicks measured for all of my containers. Then I'm gonna take my scissors and cut each measured loop. Next, I'm gonna take my wax adhesive and scrape out my desired amount with yet another janky candle making chopstick. Now this is voiceover Madeline talking. The amount of adhesive I'm grabbing is much too small. What I have is about the size of a grain of sushi rice, but what you really want is a piece the size of a pea. You really want to be liberal with your adhesive, otherwise your wick won't stay secure, as I will be reminded of in a few minutes. Okay, onward. You're gonna take your adhesive and squish it to the end of the wick. Then you're gonna press it to the bottom of the container so that the wick comes up through the middle. That means that the wax adhesive will be attached slightly off center so that the wick will be perfectly center. I'm gonna go ahead and continue this process for the rest of my containers. Okay, so I've moved the containers closer to the stove as we gear up to pour our wax into the containers. I'm arranging the containers into neat rows in order to make pouring the wax as efficient and clean as possible. Looking at the wax, it looks like I have enough for about three candles. <laughs> hey guys, voiceover Madeline again. You may have noticed that I didn't secure the wicks in my container before pouring the wax. That's because I completely forgot and it will bite me in the bum later. You'll see. Onward. So I've just discovered my flub with the candle adhesive. As the hot wax comes in contact with the adhesive, it softens, and if you don't use enough, your wick will come right up. Another important step is to fish your wicks through the cardboard holders before you pour, because again, as the adhesive softens, your wick will become super easy to dislodge, and trying to thread the wicks through after this has happened is a nightmare. However, this is a great opportunity to prove another point. 
If you mess up, it's just wax. You can always clean up, melt it down, and try again. This isn't HGTV. Mistakes happen and you gotta roll with it. Because I've got some residue left over at the bottom of my container, I'm gonna heat it back up and use it later. I needed leftover wax anyways to top off my candles later and I'll show you why in a bit. When it comes time to clean out your melting pot, as long as your wax is semi-liquid, you can take a paper towel and wipe out the inside of the pot. Cleanup is as easy as that. This will keep each batch of candles you make looking and smelling exactly the way you want it to. With a paper towel, I'm gonna wipe around the outside of this glass to minimize the amount of wax coming into direct contact with the pot. We actually use this pot for cooking and I'm not digging having wax in my food. Next, I'm gonna plop these guys right into the pot to melt. Now that the wax in our containers are liquefied, I just wanna take a moment to point out the splatters on the cutting board. Once it all hardens, I can just scrape them off the cutting board with a butter knife or paint scraper, wash the cutting board thoroughly, and all will be well. I just wanted you to be aware that although this craft can be messy, cleanup is pretty easy. Alrighty, now that these are liquid, I'm gonna turn the heat down to a simmer. The reason I'm doing this is because of something that I discovered while making votive candles, actually. As you can see really vividly here, the wax on the outside of the candle cools at a much faster rate than the wax on the inside. Because things contract as they cool, this means that the candle will end up with a sunken middle, like this. However, if you wait until the candle cools completely and then top it off with some remaining wax, then you will end up with a nice flat top. This also is a good time to add blossoms or incense if you would like. I'm gonna let these cool for a few minutes and then I'll be right back. Now, in this video, I use pieces of cardboard to secure my wicks. You can also prop them between two sticks, wrap them around a stick, secure them with a pen clip, or get creative. I've used some really complicated systems to secure my wicks in the past, but right now this cardboard method is my go-to. Hey guys and ghouls, so now that our candles have had some time to harden, I'm going to top them off with the leftover wax. Now that our candles are mostly set, I'm going to attempt to remove the cardboard. Normally, I would insist on waiting until the candles are completely set, but as of filming this, the time is 3.30 in the morning and I desperately need some sleep. After these have set overnight, I'll go in with some sharp scissors and trim the wicks to a more respectable length. Just like that, we have three new candles. Thank you guys so much for following along. I hope I've got you as excited about candle making as I am. In fact, if you do make your own candles, please share them with me using the hashtag on Instagram down below. I would love to see what you guys come up with. Also, now that I have these new candles, why not spread the splendor around? Leave a comment down below with a recommendation as to what we should do next, and in one week I will select a channel subscriber to send these little nuggets off to. Hit that like button, subscribe to win the candle, hit that bell, and don't forget, stay spooky. Sorry, boys are cleaning the kitchen. Guys, can you keep it down just a little bit? Mostly, Rayu. Thank you. I promise this usually works better.